Hi there. I'm really sorry that I can't be with you either in person or live online. Unfortunately, the stars have not aligned for us today, and I will be waving my arms around at a far more boring conference in London with you at this precise second in time. We are, however, joined by the fantastic Dr. Rose Clark, who knows far more about the subject than I do and will be able to answer any questions that you might have. So to the topic of ESG in the context of the low carbon economy and what does this actually mean? Well, you will already have heard some fantastic overviews, both from Judith and Stephanie, with regards to not only the energy transition in Southern Africa, but also mineral commodities of Southern Africa with regards to the fantastic rocks that are in the ground. Speaking as a geologist, of course, this is my happy space. Nothing makes me more happy than when we're talking about those minerals and metals and the general geology as a whole. But this is something that actually has a strange superpower with regards to not just Southern Africa, but the opportunity that we have at the moment with regards to the energy transition. My name is Dr. Sarah Gordon. I am originally a geologist. I started out as an exploration geologist, and then I went into the world of sustainability and then into risk and assurance. And back in 2014, together with a number of other wonderful people, both of whom were based in or are based in Southern Africa, set up Satala, which is a risk management and sustainability consultancy. Because that wasn't enough uh, back in 2020, together with the fantastic Rose, who you'll hear from in a little bit, we set up a not-for-profit called Responsible Raw Materials that aims to bring together people who are interested, but perhaps don't necessarily share the same perspectives with regards to raw materials and the mining sector. And finally, just within the last few months, because of course that wasn't enough, we've set up a little production company called Critical Productions. Hopefully some of the content of which you will have seen on the internet, on LinkedIn, etc. in recent months. Again, where we try and hear the perspectives and share the perspectives with regards to the true stories of raw materials. So on to the true topic of today's conversation, however, and looking at what is really meant by ESG in the context of the, the low carbon economy, or of course, the energy transition that we're attempting to go through at the moment. Well, to start with, with regards to this, the world will not be able to hit any of its targets without Africa. We've already heard from Stephanie the sheer wealth of what is in the ground. So be it with regards to the hydrogen economy and the reliance on the platinum group metals, which are truly glorious, all the way through to the likes of graphite, cobalt, etc., all of which, of course, are in beautiful varieties in the ground beneath our feet within the African continent. If we're looking just at the rocks itself, then yes, the world cannot transition without Africa. And so therefore, perhaps there is an element of power that Africa has with regards to what this transition might look like. Rose and I have spent a huge amount of time over the last few years working with governments, working with companies, working with different not-for-profits around the world, trying to understand their perspectives on what the energy transition means to them. And of course, it always means something slightly different because everybody has slightly some, something slightly different, perhaps, to either gain or to lose from this energy transition. So... What can ESG bring to the table? Well, yes, on one hand, it can be an incredibly emotive term, but if we peel back the lid and we try and take a look at what ESG, what sustainability is all about, it can perhaps provide us with that framework, with that mechanism, with that mechanism through which we can hold ourselves to account and actually measure progress that will then allow us to make sure that any change that we do go through is just, is fair, and of course ensures that those who perhaps are the ones that live on top of those minerals and metals have the most to gain from all of this. So let's go back in time, let's go back to the 1980s, and I'll do a really quick run through as to what do we actually mean by sustainable development and this thing called ESG. 
So back in 1987, the seminal paper called Our Common Future was drafted by the United Nations. Sometimes this is called the Brundtland Report, but basically within this report, they coined the, the definition really for sustainable development, which was along the lines of it is development through which we, we allow current generations to prosper, but also we don't compromise future generations. Now, this still holds true to this day, maybe with one little tweak. And that is instead of using this word compromising, perhaps we're looking for something more positive than this, because perhaps what we do today could actually enhance what future generations might be able to do. And in fact, that is probably what's needed because the world is heating up very, very quickly at the moment. And we uh, we need to do something fairly drastic to arrest some of our changing climate, perhaps. So what people would talk about then in the 1980s when they were talking about sustainable development, they would look at three things. They would look at social aspects, environmental aspects and economic aspects. And as you can see from what are on these lists at the moment, it's pretty much exactly the same as what we would speak about today in 2023. However, the bit in this that always confuses everybody is this word economics, because to many people, economics just means money. But actually what the United Nations was really referring to here was the distribution of wealth. So it was a much deeper interpretation than that shallow look at just finance that perhaps sometimes people default to. We then cycle forward to the 1990s, and, and this is when John Elkington began to use his alliteration, so people, planet and profit, which is remarkably similar to the social environment and economics of the 1980s. And yet again, what we find with regards to this particular nomenclature is that word profit of course, uh, comes a cropper because people think that, again, we're just talking about money when we're not. We're really talking about equal growth. We're talking about sharing of that wealth. Now, the reason why I bring the three P's into the table alongside sustainable development is that these were um, perhaps uh, designed, matured by different groups of people. So the three P's really comes from the financial world, whereas sustainable development was being driven by people who were very, very good in the likes of, say, human rights, for example. So individuals who didn't necessarily speak an awful lot. Now, with regards to the three P's, of course, luckily this evolved. And so now when people are speaking about people and planet and profit, they usually actually replace profit with prosperity, which I think perhaps encapsulates a little bit more about what it's about or perhaps is a bit more accurate. This then, of course, evolves into a whole range of different frameworks and approaches, et cetera, such as the Millennium Development Goals, but also then in 2015, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which we can see here on the screen in front of us. Now, these are big. They am, are ambitious. To be honest, when people signed up to them in 2015, the target date for delivering on them was 2030. So to, we're beginning to run out of time to be able to deliver on the sustainable development goals. But this is important because, as we can see on the page in front of us, only one of them is overtly linked to climate change. And so therefore, perhaps to the, the, the guts of what is driving the energy transition. So climate change is just one of many aspects within sustainability, sometimes companies especially because they're being required to buy either re regulations set by governments or by investors really focus in on either climate change or a narrow subset of climate change such as emissions. But actually, when we're looking at something as dramatic as this or as, as big as this, we cannot do it without thinking about the rest of the sustainable development goals, because all of them are interconnected. Uh, these goals are big. They're ambitious, as I mentioned. How are people actually delivering on them? And this is where we go into this world of ESG, because ESG provides us with a slightly simpler mechanism through which we can go, OK, how do we eradicate poverty and create true equality within the next few years? Not saying that that can't be achieved. It would be fantastic if we could do that. But but how do we actually get there? And, and ESG provides us a bit more of the mechanism as to what and how we can really focus in on. 
So ESG just stands for environment and social and governance. So note the governance itself is its own specific component part of this. We're not talking about the governance of environment and social. We're talking about the governance of everything within our organizations. And if I just dip into this in a little bit more detail, don't worry, we'll provide these slides for you later. If we look at the environmental aspects, not just through the lens of mining, but of course, broader than this, we're talking about everything from land use and biodiversity through to waste management. What do we do with regards to all of that? Yes, of course, the likes of climate change, et cetera, is there. But we also, of course, have water. So water is incredibly important to the environmental side, but it's just as important to the social side of things. So we have massive overlap that sit between the E, the S, and then, of course, the G as well. On the social side of things, this is perhaps a bit more difficult to, to measure, certainly compared to the environmental aspects, because here we're talking about feelings, we're talking about perceptions, we're talking about what do lots of different groups of people perceive to be the value that they will get out of something happening in front of them? And, and, and how do we find a shared value in that particular system? We're looking for social impacts, be they negative, be they positive. All of this, of course, then coming into very tangible things, such as the granting and the maintaining of permits, which, of course, are so important for exploration and mining. And then we have the governance aspects and governance is perhaps the most difficult to define in terms of ESG. And that's because there are two main aspects to it or two main components. Firstly, we have the governance on a, on a government level. So that is how is the country actually governed? What's going on with regards to the regulatory bodies? What about the ministries, et cetera? But then secondly to this, we have the corporate governance of the companies who are involved. So how do we actually run our organizations? What is our company culture? How do we engage with different stakeholders? Do we pay our tax or do we see how, how long we can get away with not paying it? What about diversity within our companies? What does it look like? And these three areas all roll together to give us E, S and G, which in turn should be able to give us a much more meaningful sustainability for, for that little patch of the world that, that we can actually influence. So the E, the S and the G, the environment is all about nature. It's about protecting and optimizing our planet. It's about stewardship and balance. On the social side, it's about people and ensuring that all of those people who are involved have choice, that they have dignity and respect and can bring all their innovative ideas to the table. And then on the governance side, it's about culture. It's about compliance and accountability and, of course, about trust as well with regards to what it is that we're trying to actually deliver on. So with this, of course, those different component parts of the environment, the social, the governance, or all of sustainability, they're all interconnected. We all know that if you are an exploration geologist and you go in and you speak to somebody in a member of the local community and you say, hey, we're all going to become rich, <laughs> that can then spark all kinds of potential challenges, not just in the immediate term, but in the future with regards to that particular asset itself and perhaps the broader industry in that region. So all of these different aspects are interconnected. And also when we're looking at this like, through the lens of be it a company or be it a government or, or whatever we're talking about, we don't just think about ESG in isolation. It is something that when we're trying to ascertain the so what with regards to why we should actually manage it, we need to think about it in alongside the financial management, the legal management, the health and safety, the technical aspects, etc., of the organization itself. It is something that um, really, truly needs to be integrated into what we're actually doing as an organization. Because if we don't do that, it's very easy for us to make grand commitments with regards to ESG that in actual fact, we have no true desire to actually deliver on, which is of course a fail safe way to generate a total lack of trust with all of the different interested parties who might be very, very key to being able to progress a project to the next level. 
So ESG itself can be incredibly emotive as a topic, depending on where you are in the world, how different cultures have been interpreting ESG, you can get huge pushback on it. We're seeing this especially in the likes of the US at the moment, or perhaps last year. And then more recently, there seems to be a little flutter at the moment in Australia with regards to the ASX. But what we tend to find here is that ESG itself, yes, it's very emotive, but there seem to be two separate discussions that are getting muddled. In the world of finance, yes, there's a huge amount of money to be made or lost, depending on how you spin your ESG. And I use the word spin very intentionally. So there's a huge amount of discussion, discussion metrics, targets, ratings, etc. in that area that may or may not be creating a bit of a problem at the moment. On the flip side, can we afford to hang around and get begin to trust one another before we take action with regards to things like climate change or any of the other sustainable development goals well the answer of course is no we're we're seeing our climate changing before our eyes at the moment and for the sake not only of ourselves but our future generations and everything else on the planet we we better start taking some action with regards to this pretty soon otherwise we're going to end up with a massive problem so ESG itself can be incredibly emotive, but when someone pushes back on you with regards to ESG, it's my feeling at the moment that the general pushback on ESG is mostly on the finance side and the mechanisms for measuring all of it. Actually, with regards to sustainability, et cetera, as a whole, that is something where people generally are more aligned with regards to saying, yeah, actually, we should do something about all of this. So ESG can be an incredibly emotive topic, and this is just a link to another talk that I gave a little while ago with regards to this. But the thing with regards to the energy transition and the ESG component parts of it, which, by the way, ESG is like all of it is important to the energy transition. So, so that is why I haven't picked out from a list which bits are important to the energy transition, because all of it is we're seeing a huge amount of change. And the thing that's driving the change at the moment is climate change, because climate change is the ticking clock of sustainability. And you can see here that social sentiment has been here for a long, long while. Government interest, of course, has begun began to come through sort of in the 1980s, the 1990s. We began to see some regulations coming in. The thing that's begun to make the real difference perhaps has been the interest from the finance community, because, of course, how do you make things change? Well, if you change those financial requirements, that sparks massive change very quickly. And of course, that's that's seeing the change actually come through in um, in earnest. So how do we make this easier for ourselves? Because it all sounds pretty fluffy in terms of what ESG actually means. Well, the good news is that there are about a billion different standards. OK, I, I am exaggerating slightly. Um, there aren't a billion standards, but wow, does it feel like there are. It's an absolute nightmare at the moment in terms of the different standards, frameworks, guidance, et cetera, that we're expected to comply with right now. And when we look at these, it's very clear to see that, that some of them are more or less pertinent to say the operations component part of a mining operation, whereas others perhaps are more useful in exploration. The number of companies who have come up to me over the last few year, years and said, oh, we're too early for ESG. If I had if I had a rand for every time someone said that, I would be a rich person. Um, of course, ESG is, is almost more important right at the beginning of exploration because it's then when we understand our context, it's then when we actually establish how do I actually want to run this company, this organization? How can I make sure that anything that I'm changing on the land in front of me actually then manifests with positive impact in the broader sense with regards to sustainability roundabout? So exploration is absolutely key. Now, of course, we're going to talk about this later on during the conference, I'm sure. Within that world of exploration, it, it is very rare for a company who has actually gone 
down to the effort of truly understanding the environment, social and governance aspects and actually take an action to make sure that those potential threats are minimized and the opportunities are enhanced. It is very rare for that effort to be valued properly when that particular asset is no doubt sold to someone who might develop it further or the operator, et cetera, because, of course, that's how our mining journey tends to work. However, of course, this is changing, not just with the incorporation of ESG in a more concerted manner within the Crisco codes. And again, thank you very much to South Africa for really taking the lead on all of this. Of course, this is nothing new to the SAM code. You've had the guidance for well over 10 years now and the rest of the world has just copied you. But this is something here where if we can make sure that the environment, social and governance factors are incorporated in a meaningful way into those modifying factors of what we think is actually in the ground, that makes a massive difference to what then happens downstream. Part of the problem, of course, with this is not only do you perhaps need a whole orchestra, to quote Teresa Steele Schober, an orchestra of people with those different skill sets that can tell you what might be the environmental threats and opportunities or social threats and opportunities alongside, of course, your geologists, your engineers, your economists, etc., um, but also you, you need to be able to review this asset over time because things change, not just with regards to, well, how much water is falling out of the sky, so what's our water availability, but then through into social sentiment and what might be going on. Because, of course, when we're thinking about a particular asset, it's sometimes very easy just to look inwards to, like, within our particular fence, whereas in actual fact, we are all one sector, and certainly the wider world doesn't view us any differently from somebody who might be down the road or maybe in another country who goes and destroys cultural heritage or um, is found to have behaved badly or bribed officials, etc. There is a cross-contamination effect with regards to us um, between different projects, between different organisations. But the good news with regards to this is perhaps that because the energy transition is very much on the radar of governments all over the world, it is very much in fashion for a government to have written a critical minerals strategy, hopefully with an action plan and some sort of tangible change that comes along with that. But what this means is that we've now got government officials asking about raw materials, about supply chains, about the environmental, the social, the governance impacts with regards to these different aspects in these different projects in ways that they would never have done before. Back in 2021, when the UK hosted COP26, as a geologist, I was I was very privileged to, to go along. And I when I got there, I was incredibly frustrated because I was told that mining had been told that they weren't welcome as an industry because mining had no place in the energy transition. Now, this was frustrating for two reasons, A, because it's just plain wrong, and B, how embarrassing, <laughs> I mean, surely from a UK perspective, we're not as silly as all that. Anyway, to give our government its due, it did realise its mistake, and nine months later, um, upon consultation with a huge range of different experts, the UK did actually publish its critical mineral strategy. Now, within that, that has now sparked the discussion about mining in the UK that hasn't happened since the 1980s when we had huge strikes with regards to our coal mines. But what that means is not just in, in the UK, but all around the world, um, people are asking questions and are interested in what it is we do, whereas previously they would have yawned and <laughs> found a way to change the subject. So what are some of the questions that they're asking? Um, the questions are numerous, but some of the ones that have been po posed in the UK at the moment is, is what are the what are the data sets? What's actually being measured with regards to mining at the moment? And of course, many people talk about the financial aspects. And of course, um, the financial indicators usually pertain to actual real operations um, that are digging material out the ground and selling it. But the nice thing that's beginning to happen around the world that is pertinent to the energy transition, because this is primarily focused on those minerals and materials that is actually then needed for the energy transition, 
Um, but also they are metrics that are required by governments and governments don't just look at money. Actually, it's their job to try and make sure that their countries experience a more developed future. So here we get to play with a whole load of metrics that might not normally have been applied to companies or to mining organizations. And this is where we can bring in things like the natural environment and social aspects. Now, these graphs in front of you here, they are purely theoretical, but the general gist of this is, OK, so if you have a potential project um, and before you start, there's going to be some lovely biodiversity, which, yes, you are going to damage when you mine. Um, there will always be some sort of impact um, when you go and do this. From a social perspective, every time I draw this chart, I add in extra wiggles because it depends on where the operation might be, what people think about it, what kind of engagement has gone on in there. And then, of course, you've got those financial aspects. Now, of course, traditionally, when you get to the end of your life of mine, of course, the finance generally falls off a cliff. You leave, or historically, there have been many examples of leaving a terrible disaster behind us in terms of environment and social aspects, which is terrible, and we, we need to work out what to do with them. But if you plan this properly, and if you visualize that package of land, not just for its value in terms of maybe platinum, maybe copper, maybe lithium, whatever it might be. So you visualize that patch of land for its value in terms of, say, water, biodiversity. Um, what's the land being used for by people? So how are they surviving on that land? And I say this because my family are farmers in the northeast of Scotland. So, so very much the land is about agriculture for us. If you do that and you think, OK, actually on balance, yes, we can dent the environment a little bit in the short term in order to be able to get to the copper. But if we design this mine site properly, and we look to optimize all the value of this land because maybe there's something else in the land that we can now get to if, of course, we open it up enough to be able to get to that copper. Then what does this developed future look like? Maybe hundreds of years down the line. And, and that's what we should really be looking at here. And, and this is what governments begin beginning to think about. Even democracies where everyone seems to be having an election in the next 12, 24 months. So we're going to go into a little bit of a uncertain period at the moment. But, but governments are, are looking towards that developed future. And of course, you do have improvements in, say, the Crisco codes in the UNFC and UNRMS, etc., all of which begin to drive us in that direction, which is fantastic. So to bring this back to the exam question again, ESG in the context of the low carbon economy, what does it actually mean? Well, in order for us to be able to get through our energy transition, we need to embrace everything that's encapsulated within environment, social governance, all of sustainability. But actually within this, there's something more than that. The need for the energy transition could be the mechanism through which we can make sure that those who actually have the rocks in the ground beneath our feet, they are the ones with the power because they are the ones with the minerals and the metals that the rest of the world need. So therefore, they can decide how are we actually going to mine this? How are we going to sell it? Who are we going to sell it to? And in what form? What level of beneficiation happens here? What kind of model do we go for? Do we go for um, metals as a service? Do we lease those metals out to the rest of the world? Because now people are beginning to see things in a much bigger system, in that circularity. Some of these models will work. Some of these models won't work. But we will never know which ones are optimum unless we begin to go and try them. So with that, I shall say thank you very much and hand you over to the fantastic Dr. Rose Clark if you have any questions. Thank you.